So this evening we're going to be discussing um, recent political changes in Japan and how that's affected Japan's external policies. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have two of Japan's leading experts on this topic, and luckily they appear to be good friends. Um, <coughs> so um, first of all, we're going to hear from Professor Satoshi Machidori. Um, he is Professor of Political Science at Kyoto University. Um, both of them have actually spent periods of time overseas. So in the case of Professor Machidori, he was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he got his MA. Um, and he's written uh, books about Japanese politics, including Political Reform Reconsidered, The Trajectory of a Transformed Japanese State, um, and The Japanese Premiership and Institutional Analysis of the Power Relations. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Professor Harukata Takenaka, um, he's Professor of Political Science at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, which is often known as GRIPS. And he got his PhD from Stanford. Um, and he looks at the role of the Prime Minister in Japanese politics and changes in Japanese external policy, um, exactly the sort of areas we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and he also has published a number of books, including Evolution of Japanese Security Policy and the House of Councillors, and the expansion of the Japanese Prime Minister's power in the Japanese parliamentary system. So I think that's enough introduction from me, and I'll pass over to mm -hmm. Machidori to get us okay. kicked off. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much uh, for introducing me. And uh, uh, actually, uh, it's very uh, great honor, pleasure and honor to have a um, make a presentation um, here in um, Daiwar. Uh, Anglo-Japanese uh, Foundation, and uh, actually um, it was uh, 2020 or 2021, I, I forgot the, the exact timing, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, I made a presentation on, through Zoom uh, to this foundation, the seminar. And uh, at that time, uh, definitely I did it uh, from my home. <laughs> so uh, it is a, uh, quite a, you know, um, easy going place. So um, I, I'm very, uh, I was very relaxed and uh, I'm not so nervous at all. But today um, there are so many uh, significant person uh, came here and I, I truly appreciate it. Also, I'm a little bit nervous about, um, you know, um, if you, I oh, feel um, that my presentation is not so uh, was full. So, um, I, so in this sense, I, I'm a little bit nervous, but I, I'd like to begin my presentation here. And uh, uh, let's start my presentation. Um, today, I would like to address the following two questions. The one question is, how has Japanese foreign policy changed due to the political reform? And the second question is, why um, it has happened? Um, I will focus on the causal relationship between institutional changes in domestic politics and foreign policy changes. And, and to, do, um, to deal with this project, uh, this uh, topic, I will focus on the fundamental ideas and historical developments of political reform and their effects on foreign policy. And I deal with the first topic quite uh, lightly uh, the, here. I'll back to that topic later. Um, Japan's foreign policy has gradually uh, become more proactive uh, since the 1990s, um, as uh, evidenced by following uh, the timeline. The, uh, it was start from the, uh, the Gulf War experience. The, the Gulf War was a decisive end of traditional thought and style of foreign policy. At that time, uh, you know, uh, the change of the international environment after the Cold War, uh, the Japanese government did not uh, or could not take a quite effective reaction to the Gulf crisis and Gulf war. And it was a starting point of the political reform in some sense. And then during the 1990s, the Japan has gradually, or reluctantly, uh, became a um, proactive uh, player to the interna new international environments. For example, the participation to the US, UN peacekeeping cooperation in 1992 and the tough negotiations. Uh, it, in other words, the Japan began to say no to the US uh, um, Clinton administration uh, during the late 1950s, 1990s. And the, um, in the 21st century, uh, it started with the war on terror uh, after the 9-1-1 attack, 
um, in the United States. At that time, the Prime Minister Koizumi gave a very strong support for war on terror. And then in 2006, um, the first Abe administration advocated the value-oriented diplomacy. And then the second Abe administration uh, advocated the free and open and pacific strategy. It's a very um, active attitude to the international environment. Um, it's far beyond the margin uh, when we talk about the um, Japanese government and Japanese people's attitude uh, to the international environment in the, uh, during the Gulf War. Then, uh, alongside this change of foreign policy, uh, there was a, a parallel development of external political reforms, uh, which extended nearly all the public spheres. When we remind that the uh, Constitution gave the fundamental rules of the government or public governance, uh, what Japan experiences so should be seen as the substitutional change of its Constitution. It includes the electoral reform, administrative reform, and judicial reform, central bank reform. It, it changes the relationship between the government and central bank and devolution. And other related areas were also affected. For example, education and education system is also um, changed in some sense. And also, um, uh, for example, the, the corporate governance is also affected by uh, or uh, reformed by the same kind of uh, trends. However, the extensive reform uh, ended up mixing uh, multiple di different uh, directions. And, uh, for example, uh, the policy making process at the central government has greatly changed. Uh, it means the concentration pow of power is found in, at the central government level. It means that, that the strong uh, Prime Minister's office leadership. In Japanese, the Kante Shudo is a, a very typical um, expression of the two for describing the contemporary Japanese domestic politics. Uh, at the same time, the cross-domain relationship, the center, and local, and government, and central bank, etc., has become lacking smoothness. And uh, uh, for example, we um, demand the situation during the the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, the local government advocated a policy uh, which is not, not fit with uh, the central government's uh, directions or something. So such kind of situation has happened as a result of the um, political reform during the 1990s, I think. And uh, to explain about the um, political reform and its effect or causal relationship, uh, many existing studies we have. However, uh, due to the time limitation, I will skip uh, the, the explanation in detail. But uh, some people, uh, it's a product of the fever, boom, or mood, or something. Uh, and other people are uh, kind of the, the conspiracy of neoliberalists. The political reform has been uh, the, the products of the conspiracy of the neoliberalists, neo according to some scholars. <laughs> I, I, I'm not agree with that, but in any case, this kind of view, uh, many views are uh, already offered. Uh, however, I think um, it, we should uh, two more key factors. Uh, this is my view. Uh, the one thing is that the the common fundamental idea, uh, there, there were a common fundamental idea covers almost all the, uh, the, the, the policy areas or reform areas. Uh, I should say this is a liberal modernism. It, it makes for, it is a kind of ideas that um, make the Japanese politics and society more liberal and rational. And the other fa key factor is the localization of this idea in each domain. Because domain, for example, the, the relationship between the central and the local government and the, the, the transformation of the administrative system, is that there are many domains that in, covered by the political reform. But at that time, each domain has um, their own uh, players, actors uh, within the domain. So um, in that sense, 
um, and, and also each domain has its own history. So um, it, it is necessary for each domain to have uh, the, the common ideas also as well as its localization uh, to each domain. And uh, this is a um, the general picture of my understanding. There, are, there were, uh, there was a fundamental idea, but uh, its localization makes the, in in some cases um, concentration of power within domain. In, uh, in other cases, the separation of power between domains. These kind of, of things that happen uh, when we see the whole picture of the the political reform. And uh, so here, um, after uh, there are some slides give more detailed analysis of reform process in each domain. Uh, however, uh, due to the time limitation, again, um, I need to skip almost all of these. And uh, but in any case, the electoral reform has a, a typical case of power concentration. And I will skip the detail. And uh, there, uh, the. However, I need to deal with the results of the electoral reform. Um, the one result of electoral reform is the power concentration within major parties. And party executives dominate, dominate over rank and files, and factions, uh, the LDP factions almost become meaningless. And bottom-up policy-making process declines, and one of major sources of uh, Kante dominance today. And also intra-party competition. So major parties, uh, you know, competition, pa competition between the major parties is still weak, however. Uh, the, uh, um, the DPJ government since the 19, 1909 to 1912 as a expected result. However, um, it was, uh, it was a, I, I should say it was a few, uh, failure as, um, of um, the DPJ government was a failure. So as a result, uh, the Japanese voters and Japanese general public uh, did not expect, do not expect much to uh, major party other than the LDP uh, even to, until today. So as a result, the um, intra-party competition is still weak. And another uh, thing I should um, deal with is administrative reform. Also, uh, this, uh, this is also a typical case of the power concentration, but the um, in detail uh, explanation should have, should be skipped. And I, I yeah, okay. And here, I uh, just mentioned the result of the administrative reform. It is combined the electoral reform uh, the uh, the prime minister and um, can have much greater influence on policy making um, because electoral reform made the the the, part, the prime minister as party executive uh, much stronger than before and also administrative administrative reform gave much power uh, to make or um, design the policy uh, for the prime minister. So in this sense, prime minister can have two kinds of powers. One is a power as party executive, and other uh, source of power is come from the uh, the leader of the administrative system today. And uh, this slide or data uh, is a um, illustration of the, the 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 much stronger the prime minister. Uh, this is a data from the, uh, the Prime Minister's meeting opportunity data. The, this data is shown every day in newspapers. And so I gathered uh, more, than, uh, 30, more than 30 years data and the who, or, uh, who and how often the Prime Minister uh, see uh, in, in, the, in their term. Uh, in his term. So um, the, before the um, executive or administrative reform period, the um, prime minister offers 24% uh, of the meeting opportunity to rank and file uh, MP members, rank and file LDP members. However, uh, today, uh, these rank and file MPs only uh, offered 15% of meeting opportunities of the prime minister. 
So it means that the prime minister uh, does not have to see the rank and file members today because the prime minister can decide the policy uh, with very small or limited uh, number of core cabinet members. And so uh, it shows the data, the core cabinet member is 80% of meeting opportunity before its reform. But today, 25% um, of meeting opportunity is offered to the core cabinet members. So it means that the prime minister can decide their, his own policy uh, to conduct with the core cabinet mem members rather than the rank and file MPs. Uh, so and the separation case, the, on, the, on the contrary to the concentration power of power in the, as a central government, the relationship between the central and local government clearly uh, oriented the more separation. So I need to skip the detail. But in any case, as a result of, uh, as a result of these reforms, the Japanese state has had uh, the following char characteristic. The, oh, the one thing is a, the localization made the same idea go different directions, domain by domain. And, and as a result, the institutional the bundle or uh, the, um, the connection was disturbed. And in this sense, I think that the Britain has also uh, offered a typical case of the, uh, the disturbed bundle. Uh, you know, uh, in the case of the Britain, uh, so for during, uh, until the 1990s, so Westminster system or something is uh, established and they, the very strong prime minister leadership and the very strong power of the, um, the lower house and a relatively weak local government and, and so on. So such kind of things is uh, disturbed after the late, since the late 1990s uh, due to the, some reforms. Uh, for example, the power of the upper house becomes stronger, and the local government is also a strong policy making player. So, in this sense, the Westminster system is a uh, bundled or um, dismantled into uh, the small pieces today. So, such kind of unbundling led to have coordination problems. So, it's a the central local government relations is a typical case of this kind of. Uh, uncoordinated situation. Well, um, some areas have result, solved coordination problems by substi substantial recovery of connections. Uh, for example, the BOJ, the Central Bank of, Jap uh, of Jap Jap Japan, uh, gained a more uh, the cooperative uh, president of the government, uh, the, the bank, uh, since the 2013. And since then, the, the coordination between the central government and BOJ, uh, at least to some extent, recovered. And today, uh, Japanese financial policy is affected by the central government in, in, in many cases. So uh, this is a, um, the, 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 the general picture uh, of the, the reform process. The, the prior to the reform, there, were, uh, there was high level of coordination among the electoral relationship and, uh, uh, between the government and the central bank. Uh, however, the coherence also meant a low um, responsiveness to the uh, external um, environments and uh, lacks, uh, lacked inclusiveness of the Japanese government. And today, uh, after the reform, the electoral system and the bureaucratic system established a new coordination relationship. Uh, which led to the central government making do more dynamic policy changes. Uh, the prime minister's dominance is a typical result of the new coordination. Uh, also, it makes possible to adopt uh, to change the changes the external environment quickly and to um, include more voices uh, in the decision making processes, at least to some extent. Uh, so, on, so these kind of things um, give some effects on the foreign, mo foreign policy. Um, the, to understand the, um, the changes, uh, the, let's first uh, take a look at the uh, older uh, policy making uh, style. Uh, 
in, in, it, it is um, often called the Yoshida Doctrine. Uh, it, it composed of the strong orientation to economic development with small military. And member uh, tried to be a member of liberal international order during the Cold War. And uh, uh, this kind of Yoshida Doctrine policy line was based on the Constitution as well as U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And it, this kind of system or doctrine is uh, interconnected with domestic politics. Uh, LDP's predominance and the leftist party is focusing on f foreign policy from the viewpoint of the constitutional matters. And general public also had a very strong anti-war sentiment. So um, Japanese government and LDP do not have to or do not, uh, could not um, take the uh, strong orientation to have strong military or uh, some very active uh, foreign policy. Rather than that, uh, it, it, LDP government and the, um, the Japanese government uh, should be um, a very good follower of the US or some other uh, the Western countries during the 1955 system. However, uh, the international situation has changed since the 1980s. Uh, the Japan became a competitor of other developed countries and economic friction with the U.S. and the uh, European countries and, uh, and the, um, the G7 members or G5 or G7 members, uh, other G5 or G7 members, uh, the Japan has to take the international burden sharing. And at the late 1980s, the end of the Cold War and the rise of the regional powers, and, and Japanese government should take, uh, should do something to care about this uh, new international environment. However, as I mentioned, early 1990s, the Japanese government did not uh, or could not take such kind of initiatives because the Yoshida Doctrine or the 1955 system is, was strong, still strong. And then in, during the 1990s, the, um, the, we witnessed the, the end of the Yoshida Doctrine. And the Japanese government uh, or ja Japan was necessary uh, to, uh, to, to have more active roles in the new international order. And uh, from junior partner to ally member of the US, and voters also expected more realistic opposition parties. It means that the, uh, not from the constitutional context, rather than that, um, more um, effective policy, uh, you know, uh, focus should, is necessary for uh, even for the opposition parties. So uh, this kind of change is the connection with uh, the political reform, and uh, uh, the expect expectation for new foreign policy in during the 1990s. Uh, Japan should be a uh, more responsible and active player of international regime, and the, um, it, inc it included the military burden. And, uh, and also, uh, the Japan is, was expected to be a strong relationship with U.S., uh, including the military operations. And, and, and this kind of new kind of policy um, should be care more centralized and responsible government at the central level. And uh, it means that the prime minister and the cabinet as should be a, ma a major actors. And, and opposition shares the fundamental directions of the foreign policy. Uh, it is a, a kind of a, um, the typical or idealistic uh, you know, directions of the new for foreign policy uh, since the 1990s. And, and, and among them, um, the centralized prime minister or centralized government should take care uh, mainly for foreign policies has realized. However, the opposition still uh, a little bit um, take unrealistic policy lines in many cases. Um, but in any case, uh, the central government reforms um, makes uh, the power concentration and the centralization of the uh, intra-party organization, that these kind of changes can Japanese government to ha uh, can um, make Japanese government 
possible to more proactive uh, foreign policy and also uh, make a more dynamic policy changes. And uh, other reforms uh, is uh, sometimes the problematic. For example, the, the, the change of the central local relationship makes the prefecture and the local governments have potential veto powers to the foreign policy. And uh, it was typical uh, you know, uh, case that the, the Okinawa prefecture, the Okinawa has a, uh, so many US bases. And, okay, and the people in the Okinawa uh, Islands uh, strongly opposed or unsympathized with uh, the US, policy ba U US military bases. So um, in this context, the, the governors and mayors in Okinawa area has been strongly opposed to uh, the US military bases. And uh, it is not fit with the central government policy, foreign policy line. So this kind of things has happened as a result of the, uh, the political reform. So in this sense, we need to know the, the, the political reform since the 1990s make uh, the Japanese government more active foreign policy in, in one sense. But at the same time, in other sense, uh, the same kind of political reform make local government give more veto powers. And it is a kind of obstacle to uh, make a dynamic policy change in foreign policy. So uh, in this sense, we currently witnessed a um, new style of foreign policy making. And the prime minister is uh, dominated in uh, foreign policy making. And the, it, is, uh, it became more, uh, much, much clearer since the Koizumi administration, since uh, 1921. Uh, and its heyday, uh, up until then, it was the during the second Ad 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 Abe administration uh, since 2012 to, to 2020. And uh, other prime minister, not so strong, however, are also dominant uh, in foreign policy making. And they, um, along with that, the, the, Jap the political reform is still uh, continued and, and, and gave, gave more institutional basis to um, new policy line or new styles of foreign policy making. It, mean, it includes that the establishment of the National Security Council in 2014, and Prime Minister can have National Security Special Advisor since the, the 2014. So th this kind of things uh, make it possible to have new styles of foreign policy making today. And also, we should focus on the changes of the public opinion and journalism. And uh, uh, the public opinion and journalism are more interested in foreign and national security policies and less absolute anti-war sentiment due to the generational effect. And the, uh, also, the Japanese general public witnesses the effects of the Chinese uprising in the russo ukraine war, and these things uh, have an effect of to, to change the public opinion recently. And local politicians as veto players in disturbing factors uh, will be continued in the near future. And I, uh, however, um, in general, I think that the, the prime minister dominance in the policy, foreign policy making will continue uh, in, in general. Um, However, uh, even for the, pri uh, the strong prime minister, the realistic uh, the de ch range of choice is limited due to the international environment and the US and some other Western countries for po foreign policy lines. And also, uh, we need to care the fiscal limitation too. And the also, I think also that the local uh, politicians will, uh, will continue to have uh, the veto powers in the near future. And uh, because the local voters support these politicians. And uh, also the Japanese general public uh, give very strong support for local autonomy in general. So even in the foreign policy areas, um, the Jam Japanese general public often support the local government to oppose the central government. So in this sense, I think uh, we will witness uh, 
the two kind of things in the near future. The one thing is the prime minister's dominance and also the local veto players uh, for a significant role. So this is the end of my presentation. I, I take 29 minutes. I'm sorry a little bit over time. But in any case, thank you very much. OK, thank you very much for having us uh, this evening. I'd like to thank uh, Jason J uh, Mr. Jason James and uh, Ogawa-san for hosting us and making uh, necessary preparations uh, for us. Um, and accommodate our request to if we to could be a if it could be possible to make presentations at uh, Diamond Foundation, and uh, it's nice to be back to Diamond Foundation. This is really I, I found this the third time. Uh, I think in in the past I ha I, I uh, had the privilege of making presentations on Abenomics. I think in to the back in 2014 and some other topic on 2015, and I feel it's really nice to be back because. Uh, this is no compliment, but this foundation is one of the. I have been, I have been, I have made presentation a number of times uh, in the United States or in UK or um, other places. But this foundation organizes. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's one of the best place to make presentations uh, f for the way it's, the seminar is organized and also for the deep knowledge uh, which audience has on Japanese uh, political economy or culture or um, various aspects of Japan. So I'm very uh, glad I could come back. And, uh, and uh, so today I would like to give uh, my, uh, share my view on, uh, I mean, just uh, keep uh, advance on uh, what uh, Machiro san has just said. Uh, I'd like to give my uh, thoughts on the relationship between uh, changing our domestic political structure and uh, rather drastic change our, in our security policies taking uh, the launch and advance of a uh, free and open in the Pacific strategy as an example. Okay. So I would like to explain why could Japan launch and advance free and open in the Pacific strategy. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, just to confirm, uh, FOIP was launched by Prime Minister Abe uh, at, in uh, 2016. And uh, it's a byproduct of FOIP is a uh, quad summit meeting among uh, Japan, United States, uh, Australia, and India. Uh, and it was uh, the, the summit meeting uh, began to be held regularly from 2021. And FOIP is very important because this is really the first Japanese comprehensive geopolitical initiative or strategy ever launched by Japanese government after the end of the uh, called uh, after the end of the, first, uh, the Second World War. And Japanese government never admits this is a security policy initiative. And it always says that it's a diplomatic effort. But when you look at, examine the substance of this, this policy very carefully, uh, it, the ultimate, it's very strategic and it's very security uh, oriented. Because the ultimate objective is to maintain balance of power uh, in, in the Pacific. And um, so this is uh, one example of changes. I mean, FOIP is one example of changes in Japanese security policies, which was uh, mentioned by Machidori Sensei already. So we, I think uh, our, our security policy really started change with uh, when we dispatched PK, uh, that we, we dispatched our self-defense force to PK operations in Cambodia in 1992. And then uh, we had a series of, uh, we, we followed a series of different steps, uh, sending our um, self-defense force abroad. And we uh, legislated a uh, security, uh, security act, which uh, paved the way for the Japanese government to exercise the right of collective defense in 2015. And uh, we, the Japanese government proposed FOIP. So uh, there's uh, just quickly on literature. <coughs> yeah, of course, uh, scholars have uh, noted that something was changing. And so they have, they have already written a bunch of articles on these changes. And uh, some of them have, of course, noted how uh, the, the change in uh, our political domestic, I mean, domestic political institutions had a significant effect. But so far, uh, not so many people have, I mean, um, not so many scholars have really examined how uh, domestic, uh, the, I mean, the, the transformation of our political system affected 
security policy formulation under Abe administration. So that's, that's why I want to examine uh, the, the formulation and uh, the uh, of, of, uh, formulation on FOIP. And uh, many scholars, again, uh, have also examined why Japan launched FOIP. And they often ascribe uh, the formation of FOIP to the rise of China. But I, I, to, to, to repeat what, what I've been saying already, I, really transformation of Japanese political structure enabled uh, administrations to launch and implement FOIP. Because FOIP is really a bundle of different economic and security policies. So it is very important for the prime minister to have enough political clout to coordinate policies pursued by different ministries under, the, under coherent strategy. And this became possible because, as Machidori-san has already said, our prime minister's institutional power has expanded since 1990s. And so I'll, I, that's to show that is my objective of uh, my presentation today. So I follow, my, um, I make my presentation in the following order. I give you an analytical perspective. And I briefly show how our uh, the FOIP strategy developed. And I introduce how various policies uh, are related to enhanced uh, prime minister's power. And uh, I, I cl close by uh, implications of uh, my presentation on the future of our uh, security and external policy. And so analytical perspective, uh, we really have to bear in mind uh, that uh, our prime minister's power has expanded as, uh, as, a, as an institution. Uh, we have carried out a series of reforms from, 90, uh, from 1990s, a political reform of 1994, which changed our electoral system, uh, the mass reform of 2001, which changed uh, our government system. And, then we, and also we created the National Security Council and um, National Security Secretariat in 2013 and 2014. And also uh, we implemented civil service reform. And uh, so uh, this enabled the prime minister to exercise a larger role in uh, policy formulation of Japan. Uh, he, came, he came to have, strangely, before the reform of 2001, the prime minister did not have a formal power to propose policies. Under the old system, it was considered that it is minister's leading department's job to propose policies. And, but uh, administrative reform of 2001 provided the prime minister formal power to propose policies. And also, uh, he obtained more power to make coordination within the government. And using this power, uh, he relied on the cabinet secretariat and cabinet office to lead uh, policy formulation. And also, the electoral political reform of 1994 uh, provided the prime minister with more power uh, to resist opposition from backbenchers. Because uh, the 1994 electoral reform, a political reform, introduced the first passport system uh, for the lower house election in, in Japanese political system. And uh, with the, under the first passport system, the prime minister can always threaten the backbenchers who oppose his policies by the possibility, with the possibility of withdrawing whip or withdrawing candidacy in the next general election. Um, I think that's what Boris did in the general election uh, for the Brexit, uh, kicking out conserv uh, the Euro, uh, hold on, the pro-EU pro, pro conservative uh, politicians from the party. Okay. And uh, to, to, to give you an evidence, how, uh, how our Prime Minister's power expanded. Uh, this is uh, ratio, so bef in good old days, before the old system, there existed a seniority uh, system. Um, um, in formal practice, if you are elected six times, then you are minister rule. Okay. And so, this is the ratio uh, who ratio of uh, those politicians who had a ministerial experience uh, with uh, among those uh, among those politicians who had a record of getting more than uh, getting elected more than six times so if you look at this ratio uh, so this is around 2000 95 percent of uh, politicians, I mean LDP politicians, who had the record of getting 
getting elected more than six times, had the experience of a uh, minister. But this ratio went down gradually, and under Abe administration, uh, it, this ratio went down to 6%, 60%. That means uh, not, oh, I mean, this, uh, the prime minister came to have more political clout so that he didn't have to uh, court to backbenchers by appointing them to our ministers. So uh, he, the, the seniority system is, is not really respected as it used to be. And the other uh, example is this is the expansion of the cabinet secretariat, uh, which is almost equivalent, I mean, which you can consider uh, treat it as a prime minister's office, a uh, supporting prime minister's uh, policy formulation. And this is, uh, the, the red is, the red line shows the total number of public officers uh, working in, that of, in the cabinet secretariat. Uh, before the reform of 2001, the number was around 700, 800. It expanded to 3,000 uh, beyond 6,000. 500. Okay. And also, this is a number of policy units set up in the cabinet secretariat. And uh, so the left side, it, it writes as second Mori uh, reshuffled cabinet. It was, before, it was around 2000 before the reform. The number of policy units supporting, helping the prime minister to formulate policy was around 10. But now uh, the number, uh, since the reform, the number has gradually expanded. And it is now around between 40 and 50. That means that the prime minister has direct control over more, uh, more policies than, uh, than before. I mean, now than, than before. Okay. So, um, and just uh, give you a quick picture on how our Japanese government developed FOIP. It is really we the, we really owe it to our prime minister Abe's in, initiative, and. Uh, Key element of key pillar of FOIP is to connect a region uh, around Indian Ocean uh, to the region around the uh, Pacific Ocean and treat the two regions under a single uh, geopolitical framework. And he proposed this vision first in 2007 when he delivered a speech. Uh, to the India Parliament when he visited uh, India. And uh, he highlighted the strategic importance of connecting the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So this was considered as the origin of Indo-Pacific as a geopolitical concept. And then uh, he also, in, in, his first in his first administration between 2016 and 2007, where well, he could only serve for a year, uh, in, the, in his first administration, he also tried to uh, set up a regular meetings among the Quad, uh, United States, Japan, India, and Australia. But uh, um, uh, other countries were a bit reluctant to have this kind of meeting at the time, uh, so he, could, he, did, he was not really successful. And so he made a comeback, into, when he made a comeback uh, in 2012, uh, he made, he, he, re, he he restarted the efforts uh, to connect uh, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, and also to set up a regular meetings among uh, the Quad. And he succeeded, uh, as, I, as, I, I, as I've said uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Okay, so let me end on. So we say FOIP, 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 but again, I kind of remember <laughs> about the about abenomics because when abenomics was I mean was was kind of pe became popular term, people then started to question, what are concrete policies under uh, abenomics besides monetary policy? And I came here all the way from Japan to provide a concrete concrete policies passed by um, under abenomics. <laughs> now here, many people say FOIP, 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 but the question is, what are the real concrete policies under FOIP? So, uh, so there are three pillars in FOIP. One is really about values. So Japan tries to promote uh, values such as rule of law, freedom of navigation, and free trade. Free trade. But our American friends are not really happy because we are not so eloquent about democracy. But we are very strategic uh, because 
there are so many authoritarian regimes in, in this region, so we, the Japanese government just does not want to scare them away. Okay. So, and policies are really related to the second and the third objectives. The, the, third, the second objective is economic, and uh, it is really a pursuit to, to promote economic development in the region. And to, to promote economic development, there are two pillars. One is uh, to, uh, to, to promote infra infrastructure development, and the other is to expand free uh, trade agreement in the region. And uh, the third pillar is security. We say it's commitment for peace. I mean, the Japanese government says it's commitment for peace and stability. Uh, it is really to, 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 to maintain balance of power. And uh, the pillar is security, to enhance security cooperation with countries other than the United States, such as Australia and India, or well, the Philippines these days. And also promote cooperation among maritime law enforcement agencies in ASEAN countries. And uh, Prime Minister's enhanced power uh, made uh, as these, all of these policies really uh, involve various ministries. So to make a coherent policies under the banner of FOIP, uh, the Prime Minister now can use his power to coordinate. And uh, he, he mobilizes uh, various organizations under the Secretariat to make coordinations under uh, relevant uh, ministries, and also I would say uh, PM Prime Minister's formal power to set an agenda, contribute and to launching FOIP and getting recognized by uh, ministries. So let me give you into the details of uh, these uh, policies. So let me start with infrastructure development. There are a number of menus. Uh, the Japan Japanese government attaches importance to quality infrastructure. Uh, and also, uh, Japanese government uh, makes cooperation with uh, the countries in the region of various project, uh, pro project such as uh, East-West Economic Corridor and Southern Economic Corridor. This is to really uh, develop uh, highways, uh, high quality highways uh, and, and roads between uh, Vietnam. Uh, running through Laos, Thailand, uh, Myanmar, uh, that's the East-West Economic Corridor, and the Southern Economic Corridor runs through Ho Chi Minh, uh, Phnom Penh, Bangkok, and that way. Okay. And uh, so we, the Japanese government cooperates with uh, countries, in the, uh, the government in the region, like making bridges or uh, making uh, a better, better, better roads. And also, uh, we, uh, the Japanese co government considers uh, cooperation with India very important, and the Japanese government made a commitment to cooperate with the Indian government to uh, construct a high bullet, uh, I mean Shinkansen uh, bullet train between Ahmedabad and uh, uh, Mumbai. Okay. And uh, so to, to run this project, you really have to involve various ministries, such as Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Land and Transportation, and the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs and Telecommunications. So to, to, to mobilize and coordinate these ministries, the uh, government set up the Strategic Council on Economic Cooperation for Infrastructure in the Cabinet Secretariat to make coordination necessary to run this project. And also, uh, the government, Japanese government used this council to mobilize a number of uh, number of different sources of uh, fi different financial sources held by different uh, ministries. Okay. And uh, free trade agreement is um, another policy uh, advanced by the Japanese government. Uh, we, uh, the Japanese government, led the negotiations such as uh, TPP, CPTPP, Japan-EU Economic Partnership to, uh, to, uh, to a conclusion. And um, again, to lead these, to, to advance negotiations uh, for these agreements, uh, Japanese government set up headquarters for measures for TPP in the cabinet secretariat, uh, creating two divisions under these headquarters, division for negotiations 
and division for domestic coordination, which, ena which may enable smooth coordination among Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Finance, uh, METI, and uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Okay. Traditionally, Japanese national interest lied in getting concessions from other countries for the markets for manufacture product, manufactured products in return for making concessions for our domestic agricultural products market. But that was very difficult before the, before the reform era because the, the ministry were autonomous, more autonomous in, those era, in that era. And so that Ministry of uh, Agriculture never agreed to uh, making concessions in, in opening those markets. And it was supported by LDP backbenchers who had a strong power to resist prime minister. So it, uh, in old days, it was very hard for the prime minister to come up with a coherent and strategic uh, negotia uh, negotiation strategy. But now, with the more power, uh, he can uh, come up with more strategic posture in trade negotiations, telling Ministry of Agriculture and backbenchers, hey guys, you have to make concessions and you have to accept concessions for the, for the sake of Japan. But in return, I will persuade the Ministry of Finance to give you some subsidies to make compensations for your loss. That kind of negotiation, uh, that kind of tactic became available with the enhanced power of the prime minister. And uh, now let me go over to security policies, uh, which are also very important. And uh, now, so this is really the important aspect. Now we put forward cooperation between the self, our self-defense force with, other, with armed forces of other countries. And uh, we do, uh, and for example, we carry out joint exercises, uh, and also um, this is joint exercises by United States, uh, Japan, India, and Australia called Marabar, uh, which are held annually now. And also we we uh, began we, initi we initiated so-called India Indo-Pacific deployment sending our uh, important frigates and carriers to important ports in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, and also, we uh, have been engaged in uh, cooperation with ASEAN countries in so-called non-traditional areas, such as disaster re relief and humanitarian aid. Okay? But the importance is to cultivate human networks among the, uh, our, our self-defense force and armed forces of our Southeast Asian countries. So to, for, to, to, to do this kind of policy, it, it was really necessary to engage Ministry of Defense. And they have, we, the Prime Minister had to put Ministry of Defense on the board uh, to, pass, to, to, to pursue uh, this policy as a part of FOIP. And uh, so here, National Security Council and National Security uh, Secretariat played an important role to engage the Minister of Defense to promote FOIP. Uh, the Japanese government uh, designed national defense program guidelines, and this is uh, officially a document uh, of uh, Ministry of Defense. But in practice, um, National Security Council and National Security Secretariat in the Cabinet Secretariat uh, really set the key principles of the new guidelines and uh, it made a commitment to promotion of FOIP and also uh, commitment to uh, expansion of multi-layered and multi-dimensional security cooperation through joint exercise and uh, practices beyond the uh, United States, uh, such as uh, Australia and India, and also it, it has reference to stra strategic port visit and capacity building of Western countries. So this is really cabinet secretariat dictating uh, Ministry of Defense what to do, and since then Ministry of Defense uh, became much more committed to uh, advance that, this kind of cooperation. And so the other important pillar is um, cooperation among uh, maritime law enforcement agencies, in particular Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, and uh, Malaysia. As you know, uh, many Southeast Asian countries has territorial disputes 
uh, with China in the South uh, China Sea. But unfortunately, uh, these countries have a very weak uh, law uh, naval law enforcement agencies. So the Japanese government offers training to coastal guards of these countries, and the training is not enough because they are, are under-equipped. So uh, the Japanese government also provides necessary vessels to these countries. And uh, again, uh, the, the prime minister used uh, this uh, so office supporting, supporting him called headquarters for comprehensive maritime policy, under the cap uh, which was set up uh, under the cabinet office. And it designed the basic plan on ocean policy in 2018, and uh, it, it stipulated various cooperation uh, menus uh, for Japanese coastal guard uh, for all Southeast Asia countries. And since then, uh, the Japanese uh, Sea Coastal Guard became, I mean, they became more committed uh, to advanced cooperation with Southeast Asian countries. So, so as I've shown, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, used not a single organ in Cabinet Secretariat, but uh, he, he, he set up various policy units under the Cabinet Secretariat and made the necessary coordination uh, to advance uh, FOIP and uh, so that 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 so that's why I say our enhanced power enabled our prime minister to advance FOIP. So let me just emphasize that to propose a policy is quite different from advancing and executing a policy. You know, you may the prime minister may uh, propose a policy, but he may not be able to follow it through. But uh, empowered power, uh, his, emp his enhanced institutional power made it possible, him, made it him possible to follow it through. So this has uh, important implications for Japanese security and uh, external policies. Uh, for a long time, uh, many scholars have considered that Japan was really passive and reactive, not taking any initiative. But I think it was, it was an, a byproduct of our domestic political institutions, which made it very hard for any prime minister to make a drastic decisions, uh, making it necessary uh, for him to spend so much time uh, uh, pa making persuasions among backbenchers and among different, uh, different ministries. So even, uh, I think, FOIB is just an example and uh, from now, I think we can expect the Japanese government to come up with more proactive uh, security policy, security and external policy other than FOIP. Oh, that's the implication. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, I spoke too much about for three minutes longer, but thank you for patience. I, I